So hi everyone, my name is Max. I work at GitHub on the Atom text editor team. And um, I want to tell you today about a project called TreeSitter that I've been working on for about four years now to try to improve on some of the core features of text editors. Uh, so TreeSitter started out as a, as a hobby project for me uh, before I even started working at GitHub. But now it's, it's part of a couple of products that we, we were making at GitHub. And uh, so I'm going to tell you today uh, explain what TreeSitter is and talk about how it's different from some other things you might have used. And then I'll show you some of the things that we're building at GitHub with TreeSitter. And then finally, I'll talk about how TreeSitter works and some of the algorithms that it uses. So first, what is TreeSitter? Um, TreeSitter is a library for parsing source code. It's written in C and C++, and it's designed to be used in applications like Atom that work with code written in many different languages. So you can use TreeSitter to parse files written in all different languages and produce syntax trees that all have the same interface. But the really unique thing that TreeSitter does is what's called incremental parsing. And that means that once you've parsed a file with TreeSitter, you can then edit the file. And TreeSitter can give you a new syntax tree that reflects the edit that you did without having to reparse the whole file over again. Uh, and Creating that new tree is super fast, and it uses very little memory because the new tree shares parts of the old tree that haven't changed from when you edited. So this feature makes it possible to use TreeSitter to, do, to, to parse source code in a text editor like Atom on every keystroke while the user is typing, and to use the syntax trees on multiple threads at the same time in the application without worrying about race conditions. And the other interesting thing that TreeSitter does is what's called error recovery. And so that means that you can give TreeSitter code that is invalid, either because you're in the middle of typing the code or because the code uses some non-standard language features that the parser doesn't know about. And if you do that, then rather than just aborting and giving you an error message like all commonly used parsers do, TreeSitter has a way of inspecting your code and figuring out where the start and the end of every error is and giving you back a useful syntax tree anyway. So that's a, the feature that makes it possible to, to rely on syntax trees that TreeSitter gives you even when you're parsing code written by the end user, which you might not fully understand. So that's TreeSitter, what TreeSitter does. Uh, and now I'll talk about how it's different from some other things that you may have used. So TreeSitter was mostly inspired by some IDEs that I've used, like IntelliJ and WebStorm. And I really like IDEs because they, they parse your code while you're writing it, and they use those parse trees as the basis for all the features in the IDE. And so everything that IDD does is really smart. But the problem with IDEs is that they're really tailored toward a specific language, and they're pretty slow, usually. So, None of the IDEs that I know of do the kind of incremental parsing that I just talked about. And so that means that whenever you type a character in an IDE, the IDE has to reparse your whole file from the beginning, which can take tens or hundreds of milliseconds, which is actually a really long time when you're talking about typing in a text editor. Um, and you can see that delay sometimes in an IDE when you type something and there's a delay before the syntax highlighting updates. And so another cool alternative to IDEs is language servers. So with a language server, you can just use a regular text editor to actually write your code, and then you use a separate language-specific program to analyze your code and to provide your text editor with these standard features like go to definition and autocomplete. So language servers are a really cool way to, to implement those particular features in a text editor. Um, but when you use a language server, there's still a lot of parts of your text editor that are pretty dumb, like core features like syntax highlighting and basic cursor movement and editing are not enhanced by the language server, and so they don't, they're not um, aware of the structure of your code. And another thing about language servers is they pretty much have the same performance as IDEs. They'll get your laptop fan spinning really loud because most of the time they have to reparse your file every time you, you type a character. And th there's also a little bit of overhead to having to send data back and forth between the text editor and the language server. And so the language servers really work best for features that can tolerate a little bit of latency. 
Also, language servers all have their own set of dependencies, usually associated with the language that the server is built to work with. And so for applications like Atom and GitHub.com that want to be able to work with a lot of different programming languages out of the box, it doesn't really make sense to bundle a whole bunch of language servers into the application because that would just add a ton of complexity. And so a lot of these problems that the language servers don't try to solve, TreeSitter does solve. It, it gives you back a syntax tree that you can use to do whatever kind of code analysis you want in your application. And it's extremely lightweight and fast, so we can embed it directly into the text editor as a replacement for the simple regex-based systems that most text editors come with for doing syntax highlighting. And also, it has no dependencies. And it, in fact, it's written in pure C, and all the parsers are pure C, so it's easy to embed them into any application, no matter what language the application is written in. All right, so now I'll show you some of the things that we're doing with TreeSitter today at GitHub. So first, I'll show you what we've done with syntax highlighting. So I think syntax highlighting is super important because it's something that most of us use pretty much all day, every day, while we're working, whether we're looking at code in our editor or on a website like github.com or Stack Overflow. And most of the time that you see syntax highlighting today, it usually looks a little bit like this. This is a screenshot from Sublime Text 3, but it's pretty similar to what you'd see in most any text editor or code website. And what we're looking at is some C code that defines a data type and some functions. And I just want to point out a few major problems that I have with this syntax highlighting. So this code contains a whole bunch of words, and some of those names refer to types, and some of them refer to variables, and some of them refer to fields of structures. And for me, it would really help me to read the code if all of the type names were their own color. But it's not that way at all. The, the types are actually four different colors here. Char is purple, and uint32t is blue-green. And then the type that we're defining is black first, and then yellow in another spot for some reason. Um, and similarly, if you look at all the struct fields, um, I would like them to be their own color because they're different from types and they're different from variables, but they're not. They're just black, which is the same color as a bunch of other things. And then finally, I would want local variables to be their own color, different from the other things I just mentioned. And I would definitely want any given local variable to always be the same color anytime it appears, um, but that's not the case here either. This variable that I'm pointing to um, shows up first in yellow and then in black, and both of those colors are also used for other things. So like, I don't think the syntax highlighting is very useful, and this is pretty commonplace, I would say. Um, and the reason it is this way is that tools like these use these simple regex-based systems to do syntax highlighting that really just aren't powerful enough to recognize the things that need to be recognized if you want to make code really readable. And just to show you that this isn't like a C code specific problem, um, I'll show you some similar code written in C++ instead of C. And if you look at the types and look at the field names and the variable names, you can see all the same problems. And the same thing happens with Go code uh, and with Rust code uh, and with probably most other languages as well. And it's also not just a problem with this particular syntax um, color scheme that I've chosen or with this editor. If you look at another editor like VS Code, and you look at the types here, char, uint32t, node, see the same problems. And the struct fields, again, are not highlighted consistently. And the same thing happens on github.com, where we all like to read code. And, um, and until recently, the same thing happened in Atom. But let me show you what it looks like now that I've re-implemented syntax highlighting to use the syntax trees that TreeSitter gives you. It looks like this. So you can see that all the problems that I called out are fixed now. The types are all blue-green, no matter if they're some known list of types or if they're a user-defined type. The struct fields are all red, both when they're declared inside of the struct definition and when they're used. And the local variables are all black. So to me, this is like ideal syntax highlighting. This is what I always want code to look like. And it might seem like a subtle improvement 
to you, um, but I really think it, it actually achieves the goal of making it so that you can kind of get the structure of the code just from glancing at the colors. And so to help show that, I'll, I'll again go through the same code written in different languages so you can kind of see that there's the same pattern of colors that you can recognize. So here's the C++ version, and now here is the Go version, where you can kind of tell that the types have moved over to the right instead of being on the left now. And here is the Rust version, and here's the TypeScript version. So in all these languages and a bunch more, we've made code a lot more readable. Um, and so another good thing about computing syntax highlighting this way based on the syntax tree is the way that we can handle long lines. So if any of you have ever opened up a, a minified JavaScript file in a text editor, you might remember that you, you either get no syntax highlighting or just a teeny little bit at the beginning of the file. And that's because of the way that syntax highlighting usually works is by running a whole bunch of individual regex searches on each line. And so the longer that the lines get, the longer this, all these regex searches take. So now, with TreeSitter, that's not a problem anymore. Um, we, can, we can compute syntax highlighting super fast, regardless of um, how a file is broken up into lines. And we can also do a much better job with just the overall speed of highlighting any file, particularly large files. If you've ever opened up a, a really large source code file that more than a couple hundred kilobytes in a text editor like VS Code or Atom, and then scroll down a bunch after opening the file, you'll remember that it, it takes a while before the, those later lines of the file get colored because the syntax highlighting systems are slow. And so on this slide, I'm just showing how long it takes to parse uh, a really big JavaScript file, in this case, the development build of React um, with, with TreeSitter. And so the, the file is like 20,000 lines long. It's 600-something kilobytes. And TreeSitter can parse it in like 54 milliseconds, which um, is fast enough that it, we can pretty much show you all the colors instantly when you open the file. So now I'll show you our, Adam's new code folding system. So code folding, it's pretty simple. It lets you hide parts of your code that you don't want to look at right now. And usually the way it works is that it's based on indentation. So lines that are indented further get hidden. And that oftentimes works, but not always. So in a lot of languages, it's common to have functions written something like this, where the function's got several parameters, and each parameter appears on its own line. And so the, the indentation actually decreases when you get into the body of the function. And so this kind of style like breaks present-day text editors in a variety of ways. And I think Sublime Text just doesn't let you fold functions if you write them this way. And VS Code and previous versions of Atom would, would allow you to fold the function, but it would look weird because half of the parameter list would get globbed together with the, the function body. And so now, with TreeSitter, we can fold functions like this just fine because we compute the locations of folds based on the syntax tree instead of based on the indentation of the lines. In fact, you can even strip away all the formatting from your code and you can still fold it just fine because we're doing it this way. Which is actually useful sometimes because sometimes you, you want to copy a whole bunch of code from one place and paste it into another in a way that messes up the formatting at first and you can use code folding to, to kind of get a sense of if the structure is actually correct or not. Another thing that I really like is that it's now really easy to define your own commands that fold your code however you want based on the syntax tree. Like I have a simple command in my, uh, in my Atom config file that just folds all the bodies of functions and nothing else. And it works across all the languages that I use, even though they have wildly different ways of writing functions in the different languages. And the code for it was super simple and fun to write, actually. It's just, I just can query the syntax tree, kind of like um, if you've ever used JavaScript on a web page to query the DOM, you can query the syntax tree like that. And I can find all the nodes in the tree that are either functions or arrow functions or method definitions and what have you. And for all those nodes, I can find the child node that represents the body of the function and create a fold there. 
Another cool one that my coworker Ash came up with is for working with test files. There's a common uh, style of test framework where you write your test using these functions describe and it, and the describes can be nested inside of each other. So if you, all the descriptions of your tests can be at many different indentation levels in your file. And so Ash wrote a, a custom folding command that just queries the syntax tree to find all the functions that are named, the calls to functions named it and to fold, create folds there so you can read your whole, your whole test file. Um, so I think these, I like these things because they're, they're pretty minor conveniences, but they showcase the power of what it looks like to have a hackable text editor where the syntax tree is available at all times. You can really, um, you can really customize your editor to, to do whatever you want to your code. Uh, so we also added a new feature that I love to add them called Extend Selection, um, inspired by some IDEs that I, that I like. So Extend Selection is a simple command that when you run it, it selects larger and larger structural elements of your code based on the syntax. And so on a Mac, you type Alt up to select up the syntax tree, and then Alt down to go back down from where you came. And um, it's a super simple concept, but it's really satisfying to me because it reinforces this way of thinking about editing code as you're editing a logical data structure. You're not just editing raw text. And it's also really practical. Like in this example, I, I use it with multiple cursors to reformat this whole data structure in a way that would actually be really time consuming to do if I had to manually move the cursors around um, to do it. So, um, and extent selection, um, not to go on too long about extent selection, but it, uh, it's really changed the way that I refactor my code too. Like I, I had this case where I had a, a data structure that was a field that I wanted to make private and so I wanted to replace all of the places where that field was used with a call to a standalone function, like a getter function. And this is something that, like, even if, you, if you're a pretty advanced code editor and you're really good at regexes and vim macros and all that stuff, you really can't do this in a general way without, without you know, manually looking at each case because of all the different ways that the code can be written. But with extend selection, you, you really can. You just use multiple cursors, and you, you go up the syntax tree to grab each field expression. And then you kind of move your cursor to take the left-hand side, and you wrap it in a function call. And you go back up the syntax tree oops, to get to the end of the function call. And then you can delete the field that you were trying to get rid of. Um, so anyway, um, makes editing a lot more fun for me. So aside from github.com, we're also using tree, or sorry, aside from Atom, uh, we're also using TreeSitter for some experimental features on github.com. So this is a feature that shipped um, almost a year ago now. Um, it's kind of been under the radar. Some of you may have seen it, where if you're looking at a pull request and you, you open up the table of contents, now it, you can see underneath each file that's changed the list of all the functions that have changed or been added or deleted. And so this was built by a, a separate team in GitHub's data science org. Um, and they have, are doing some really cool work to analyze syntax trees and diff syntax trees. But they use TreeSitter for all of their initial parsing because it gives them this um, uniform, easy way to parse a wide variety of programming languages. And so between the work that I do on, on the Atom team and the work that they're doing on github.com, we're kind of building up a bigger and bigger set of languages that you can, that you can use TreeSitter with. And so um, just yesterday, we released a new version of Atom that, that finally enables TreeSitter by default. It's been behind a feature flag in Atom for almost a year. Um, and so I'm hoping that now that we've released that, this, the set of languages that you can parse with TreeSitter is going to grow even faster, because now people who use Atom will be able to write their own parsers um, for, for languages that we don't support yet. And so the hope is that in the future, you can use this library to parse whatever programming language you want. So now I'll talk about how TreeSitter works. So when you want to add support for parsing a new language with TreeSitter, you have to write a context-free grammar that describes the language. And, um, the grammar is basically a list of all the constructs in the language, and then it specifies how you write them in terms of other constructs in the language. And with TreeSitter, you do that in this, 
um, in JavaScript using some simple JavaScript functions that I wrote. And so the, the grammar is just a, a simple JavaScript value. And I did it that way because it really makes it easy to programmatically define parts of grammars, or uh, the most interesting one is to, to define a grammar in terms of another grammar. So like I use this, this feature to define the C++ grammar in terms of the C grammar, and to define the TypeScript grammar in terms of the JavaScript grammar. So once you've written your grammar, there's a command line tool that you run that, that reads your grammar, and it spits out uh, one piece of C code that's your parser. And the C code has two main pieces to it. It's a standalone C file that you can, that you can compile by itself. And it, um, the first part is a, what's called the lexer function. So this is a big, long function that reads the input character by character and groups the characters into tokens, the basic tokens of your language. And then the second main part of the, the parser is what's called the parse table. So this is a big two-dimensional array that tells the parser when it's in a given state and when it sees a given token, what kind of actions it should do. And um, when you go to actually use these parsers, the way you do it is you use them in combination with this one other library that's called the tree sitter runtime that defines the basic data types that the tree sitter parser uses. So there's a, you create a parser and then you set the language on it, and that's the language is what is the code that's generated from your grammar. And then you can parse code and get back a syntax tree and inspect the nodes of the syntax tree. And the nodes have this simple uniform API that's a little bit like the DOM. They just all have a type, and they all have a start position and an end position and a few other properties to them. So this is showing the raw C API, which you probably usually wouldn't use. Um, we have bindings to a few different higher level languages. There's a, a JavaScript binding, which is what we use in Atom. And there's a Haskell binding, which is what the, the GitHub data science team that I mentioned earlier uses, because they, they code in Haskell. And there's also a Rust binding that I just created for fun. Um, so that's what it, kind of what it looks like to use TreeSitter. And now I'll talk about some of the algorithms that it uses internally. So most of them are based on some research that was done at UC Berkeley in the 1990s. And in particular, this one PhD dissertation called Practical Algorithms for Incremental Software Development Environments. And that dissertation kind of lays out a complete methodology for doing really efficient code analysis in an IDE or a, an editor. And it talks about what basic parsing uh, theory you should start with, and then how to extend that theory to deal with, with incremental parsing. And then it formally proves that the, that incremental parsing algorithm has these really good performance properties. And it also talks about how you should handle ambiguities and errors and a bunch of really useful topics. And so the basic parsing um, theory that it's all based on is LR parsing. So LR parsing is like one of the classic parsing theories that was invented in 65 by Donald Knuth. And it's the basis for a lot of popular tools like Yak and Bison. Um, some of you might have learned about LR parsing in college if you took a compilers class. I didn't actually, I didn't take computer science classes, so I ended up learning about LR parsing from this Wikipedia article that I have on the slide. It's a really good Wikipedia article, really like lays out the whole thing and talks about how you generate an LR parser. So I highly recommend that one. Um, so, so a lot of the more unique thing that TreeSitter does is built on LR parsing. So I'm going to briefly talk about just how L regular LR parsing works for a second. So the basic goal, just like any parsing, is to, to take a, a sequence of characters that has some implicit structure to it and to produce a tree that explicitly describes that structure. And so the way that an LR parser does that is that it, it reads the characters from beginning to end without ever backing, backtracking. And as it reads them, it groups the characters together into tokens using the lexer function, a lexer function like the one that I showed you on that earlier slide that was the first part of a generated C code. And those tokens, it groups them together into larger and larger subtrees, which it stores on a stack. 
And every new token that it finds, it decides what to do with, its, with the stack by consulting the parse table. And that, that was the second piece of generated C code that I showed. And so I'll walk through uh, uh, just a basic example of parsing a math expression, like x times y plus z. So the parser would start out at the beginning of the string uh, in a sum starting state with an empty stack, and it would run the lexer function and find that the first token in the string is a variable, the x. And so then it would look in the parse table for what to do with that variable, and it would find out that it needs to push it onto its stack. And it would do the same thing for the next two tokens, the star and the y. And then it would find the plus token using the lexer function, but then when it, uh, when it looked for what to do there in the parse table, it would find that it needed to do the other type of action, which is called a reduction. So that's where the parser pops some number of subtrees off of its stack and then groups them together into a new parent subtree and then pushes that back onto the stack in their place. So in this case, it would pop off the x, the star, and the y, group them into a product, and push that onto the stack. And then the parser would push the plus and the z, and then when it reached the end of the file, the parser would again see that it needed to do a reduction. So it would pop off the, the product, the plus, and the variable, and group them into a sum subtree, and that would end up being the root node of the, the final syntax tree. That's the, the basic um, approach. And so you might have a question like, OK, but so this, this, the stated goal of this library is to be able to parse any programming language. And so is, is LR parsing, this one theory of parsing, going to be able to work for all the languages? And so the answer to that is no, not quite. Um, almost, because most programming languages are designed to be pretty easy to parse using some um, a few different uh, parsing theories that are actually less powerful than LR parsing. LR parsing can kind of, in a certain sense, recognize a, a large uh, set of grammars. But a lot of languages also have some weird quirk to them that needs to be handled via just ad hoc code in the compiler. And so let me give you an example of one of those weird quirks. TreeSitter has a few different ways that it deals with the weird quirks of languages, but I'll show you one of them. So these are two pieces of JavaScript code on this slide. And in the first one, we're assigning to the variable x the value of the variable y. And we've wrapped y in parentheses just for no reason, just because that is valid to do in JavaScript. Uh, but in the second example, we're assigning to the variable x an arrow function that takes a parameter called y and returns another value, z. And so the reason that these, this kind of code would be a challenge for a regular LR parser is that um, it has to do with the syntax trees that we would want to create for these two examples. So for the first example where y is, a, we're evaluating y, um, the way that gets represented in the JavaScript grammar is that there's a, a node called an expression that means that something's being evaluated. And so the y identifier wants to be in, wrapped in an expression to, to indicate that we're evaluating it. Whereas in the case of the arrow function, that's not what y is. y is just the name of a parameter. And so it has this different structure where it's just an identifier node inside of a, a formal parameters node. And so the, the, again, the reason that this is a problem for an LR parser is that, um, like I said, an LR parser never backtracks. And so in this case, before the LR parser can move past the right parenthesis after the, the Y, it has to decide what should be on its stack to represent the Y. Should there be an expression subtree on its stack to represent that, or just an identifier? Um, so uh, I'll show you the way that the TreeSitter deals with this. It's, via an extension to LR parsing called GLR that just stands for Generalized LR Parsing. And so um, I'm going to walk through the example of parsing the, the second example, the arrow function. And I'll show you, again, some diagrams of the parser stack. These ones are in a different format, uh, because this is a format that's actually generated by TreeSitter to help you debug parsing. And in, this, in this, um, these diagrams, the 
the names of the subtrees are appearing over the lines in the graph, and what's in the bubble is the, the state number that the parser is in. So the parser would start out just via the normal LR parsing. It would push onto its stack the first four tokens, so the x equals the parentheses and a, a y. But then when it got to the right parentheses, that's where the ambiguity, the local ambiguity is. And so what GLR parsing says to do is to fork the parse stack into two different branches so that the parser can um, simultaneously try both uh, interpretations of the code without backtracking. And so we've got the, the upper branch where the Y is just an identifier. So that's the case where we're interpreting it as a, a parameter to an arrow function. And then in the lower branch, we've wrapped Y in an expression. And so that's the case where we're, we're interpreting it as, as if we're evaluating Y. And so we'd have to proceed parsing on with the two branches for for just two tokens um, until we see the arrow. And at that point, we can realize that we can chop off one of the branches because an arrow wouldn't be valid after a parenthesized expression. And so then we can continue on with regular LR parsing. So that's the basic approach that allows TreeSitter to be so general to parse, parse all these programming languages like C++, TypeScript that contain a lot of ambiguity. Um, so another algorithm that I'll show you is the way that TreeSitter recovers from syntax errors. So um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we need, when, when there's an error, we want to return a subtree, or we want to return a tree anyway, and the tree just should include nodes that indicate where the errors are. And so here, in this example, you have an if statement, and someone just started typing a for loop before the if statement. And so we have this invalid state where it says for if parenthesis. And so the tree that TreeSitter would produce would have a complete if statement in it, and there would just be this extra node that, that represents the fact that the word for is not supposed to be there. Uh, and similarly, if you actually did have a for loop, but then you accidentally wrote the word if in the middle of it, uh, TreeSitter would produce a, a different tree where it, it parses it as a for, for loop and it has a, an error node in the middle of it that says that the word if is not supposed to be there. So in either case, it can kind of tell what the best interpretation is of what you've done. But the interesting thing about these two cases is that they both start out with the same sequence of tokens. So it's not as simple as, as, some, as like, oh, just do some fixed procedure when you first encounter the error. And the way that I think about it is it's, it's very similar to the way that you need to handle local ambiguities, like the one I just described a second ago with the arrow function and the parenthesized expression. Like you can't know how to interpret the error until you look a little bit further ahead. And so TreeSitter uses the same facility of GLR parsing for dealing with syntax errors. So when it sees an error, like the word if after the word for, uh, it can force fork the parse stack into a couple different branches, in this case two, um, to try different means of recovering from the error, either to discard the, the word for, or to discard the word if, or, or other things. And so again, we can continue with multiple branches of the parse stack for a, a while until we figure out that what works best is to parse this as a as an if statement, and in this other case, to parse this as a for statement. So um, as far as I know, this technique is novel of like leveraging the GLR algorithm for uh, dealing with syntax errors, but it works really well in Atom. Uh, it allows us to really quickly give back a good syntax tree even when you're in the middle of typing something in kind of the same way that the, the it has that same virtue as the the crude regex-based systems that the editors have today, where they kind of work even if your, your code isn't quite right. Um, so the last algorithm that I'll show you is the way the tree sitter does the incremental parsing. So once you have a syntax tree, uh, when you do an edit, how do we come up with the new syntax tree really fast? So say you had this uh, JavaScript code, var a equals new b, 
A dot C, return A. I'm showing the, in small the, the syntax tree for that. And now I'll show you what would happen if you were to insert the letter D here inside of the argument list to add an argument to the function. And so what tree sitter, the way tree sitter would process that is it would walk the current tree that it had and it would mark all of the nodes in the tree that contained that position, the position where you edited, as having had one character inserted into them. Um, and so those are the green nodes that I show in the diagram. And then to create a new tree, tree sitter would, would start in the same initial state that it would have started in as if it were just gonna parse the whole file all over again, except that now it has this reference, which is the old tree, um, and so it can reuse nodes of the old tree that haven't changed and that which were created in the same parse state that the parser is currently in. So that's the case, in, in this example, that's the case for the whole first statement. So the, the variable declaration can be reused in its entirety. And so can the, the first part of the second statement, namely the, the member expression, a dot c. And even the left parenthesis right before the edit can be reused. And then once, once you reach the site of the edit, tree sitter has to parse from scratch again for a little while. So it has to run the tokenizer, et cetera, to produce a new identifier token. But then it can, again, reuse stuff. It can reuse the um, closing parenthesis, and then it can rebuild a new arguments node and a new call expression and a new expression statement to represent that edited part of the code. And then after that, it can, again, reuse stuff. So it can reuse the return statement and finally build a new root node, the program that represents the new tree. And so in that way, um, handling the edit it takes time that's not proportional to the whole length of the file. It's, it's basically just proportional to the, the number of edits that you made and the size of actual code that you've inserted. So that's all I got for you. Um, the next things that I'm gonna be working on are adding support for more languages in Atom with TreeSitter and on github.com, and to build new, the next set of features that use these syntax trees. You know, I've spent all this time basically trying to get this system doing all the things that the old system would do, which is a lot, like parsing JavaScript inside of HTML, inside of JavaScript, inside of HTML, and all those crazy things that, uh, that basically a TextMate parser can do. So I've finally gotten to parity with all of that stuff, and now I can actually focus on building the new exciting things that you can build now that we have a syntax tree in the text editor at all times. And meanwhile, the, the github.com data science team is building cool shit with Haskell that analyzes your code. So um, you'll, you'll see stuff coming out of that at some point. Um, both our teams are also hiring, by the way. I was supposed to say that. Adam team. <laughs> Depending on what you like to code in, yeah, the Atom team and the, the um, semantic code team, it's called. So that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for coming, everyone. Um, I'm going to do questions on, on Slido, if, if you have any. Thanks.